Welcome to the Catholic Midlife Podcast, where we're addressing the challenges and the opportunities of midlife from a uniquely Catholic perspective. Join us each week as we spark a midlife renewal and create a firm foundation for the next wonderful, exciting, awesome season of life. Hello, and welcome to the Catholic Midlife Podcast. It's great to be here with you. I'm Curtis. And I'm Karen. And we are just delighted to bring another episode in the season of The Surprising Mind. And I'm going to share a metaphor with you that I think is extremely helpful. Awesome. Awesome. Before you do that, I want to share briefly a little conversation I had. I met with a couple who said, hey, we're just starting to listen to your podcast. Mm. And the wife said, yeah, I I jumped right into self-compassion. It looked, it looked like a great season for me. And, and the guy said, oh, no, I, I have to go back and start at the very beginning and work my way forward. So it just made me laugh at, at different people's approaches to things like this and how they like to work their way through the material. And just so you know, everybody, however you want to do it is just fine. That's uh, that's really charming. There's a couple that tells us they save the podcast for when they have these automobile trips. Ooh, that's a great idea. And then they then it's something for them to discuss, and that's fun. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, and they've given us some great comments. So yes. Well, here's a proverb for you, Karen. It is better to obey the Lord and to have only a little than to be very rich and terribly anxious. Oh. Isn't that a great saying? That's a great saying. So the thing about, so it's a, you'll recognize that as a proverb. It's Proverbs 15, 16. It's an ancient virtue teaching. And, and let's not forget that sacred scripture was written a long time before, like even the English language was invented by a bunch of fools mispronouncing whatever language they're <laughs> supposed to be using. It was. Okay. This, it's ancient wisdom, literature. And, and these, these kinds of virtue teachings, they, they're designed to appeal to the intellect and to the heart at the same time. So you could, some of those Confucian sayings, they're super cool. Yeah. Or the Buddhist stuff, you listen to that and you're like, oh, wow. And it kind of hits you intellectually and in the heart. So here's another one. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And that that appeals to you on many levels. It's a bit of a puzzle, even. You know, that's a, actually a really good point. I never thought about that. But here I'm sitting and I'm like, I'm taking it in and I'm puzzling a little bit about it. But really, it is hitting me on more of an intuitive level. Yeah. And this is, make no mistake, the Beatitudes are an education and virtue. That's where Aquinas started his virtue ethics and St. Augustine as well. And it's much later in getting into the Enlightenment when other approaches to teaching virtue started in the West. And let me, let me talk about this for a second. So okay. the, the Western mind, we've been talking, Karen, about all these maps, about these filters, these lenses, and we in the West, in the US, the UK, and the like, we are so deeply enmeshed in this scientific materialism that we can't, we're not even aware of it. It colors everything we do. You know, scientists, they look for natural laws. They're reducing complex data sets and phenomena to, you know, just the fewest possible true things they can say. This is this is scientific parsimony. It's the principle of parsimony. I guess you'd know about that, yeah. being a scientist. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, and it's a reductionist approach. And so you're taking something that's complex and you're boiling it down to logical rules that are always true. And it's great. It's very powerful. But... It's a disaster when it's applied to trying to understand love, God, virtue, or basically anything that's really important. (laughs) (laughs) So you're saying we've just taken this sort of 
a general scientific philosophy. We just randomly apply it everywhere. Yeah, yeah, we do it everywhere. It's it's so deeply instilled in us. And and the Western thought, even in the area of virtue and ethical teaching and so forth, it's greatly colored by that. And that's why John Paul II called for a return to scriptural sources in Veritatis Splendor, published in 1993, the encyclical. I'm just using it as an example yeah. of how from time immemorial, people understood, they understood that you have to appeal to the whole person right. if you want them to receive anything. You have to appeal to the intellect and to the seat of emotion. Yeah. The heart, maybe? The, the heart. soul? Yeah. Yeah. Different, different words like that. Yeah. So there's a metaphor that's coined in the modern era, Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T, coined it that talks about the relationship of the conscious and the unconscious mind. Okay. It's the elephant and the rider. So there's a rider sitting on top of a very large elephant. And the rider, that's the conscious mind. That's the logical person. That's the language user. That's the goal setter. Okay. And the rider's sitting on top of this elephant. And the elephant is the unconscious mind. Hmm. And it's basically everything else. <laughs> okay. That's why it's so big yeah. and unwieldy. <laughs> yeah. And so if you want to go down a path and the elephant doesn't want to go, what do you think is going to happen? You are not going to go. That's my guess. <laughs> You're not going to go anywhere. Yeah. Okay. So, so from what you were saying earlier, are you kind of saying there's a disconnect in our kind of the way we approach life between the rider and the elephant. Yeah, one of the big disconnects is that we have these mindsets that prevent us from collaborating with our elephant. We have this idea that, hey, I'm the conscious mind, I'm in control. I, I think it and I do it. And if I have enough willpower, I get it done. And if I don't, I'm lazy or stupid. And it's a mindset that doesn't serve us. So yeah, I think there's a big lack of awareness and lack of skill in working with the elephant to get some great results. Wow. I'm thinking about this book I was just reading when we were out of the state for a week. I can't remember the author, but the title is Before You Know It. And it's by this big international researcher who studies the unconscious. And he was talking about, he was hanging out with his brother-in-law who is, was literally a rocket scientist. And his brother-in-law was said, oh, tell me what you've been studying. And so he starts telling him about how the conscious mind works with the unconscious mind and how they can be at odds and how we can be influenced unconsciously without consciously yeah. realizing it. And the brother-in-law said something like, I totally don't believe that. I cannot remember one time when I was influenced unconsciously. <laughs> I, was, I was never influenced. There's no elephant. <laughs> oh, that's not an elephant. It's my pet parrot. It's oh from Africa. Gosh. They have long noses on the parrots there. That's totally true. He's like, I don't believe in the elephant. Therefore, it does not exist, right? I never noticed it. It does not exist. That's the left hemisphere. Okay. Okay. That's the hyper intellect at work. It is. And this is a digression, but I, I can't resist. There's these stroke studies where the right hemisphere is damaged. Yeah. And what happens is you put somebody's right hand into their left hand and they, they say, oh, whose hand is this? That must be somebody else's hand. Huh. Because for the left hemisphere, it just, it doesn't exist because, because of the stroke damage, they can't sense that right hand anymore. Wow. So that's a classic left brain trick is just to deny the existence of things that it doesn't perceive. Oh, interesting. Interesting. So there's sort of the, it does not exist approach. And then as you were mentioning, there's that kind of, well, I've got this unwieldy thing, but if I just, if I just pull it and poke it and whip it enough, 
I can get it to go in the direction I want. Yeah. So that's the, that's our kind of bias mm. uh, in our culture of yeah. dealing with the unconscious mind is, yeah, you've got these unruly passions and hey, you just got to bulldoze them over, man. Got to, got to whip that elephant and, and keep on trucking. Yeah. But it, it doesn't serve us in, in the long run. And, and there are many reasons for that. So what's the goal then? The goal of what? Well, if we don't, can't ignore it <laughs> and we can't, I don't know what the word is. We can't abject it to our every desire. What, what do we do? Well, we want to collaborate with it. And after all, it's part, it's a part of us. Yeah. If there's anything I've learned is that there's no part of us that should be rejected. There are parts that we don't like or that make us uncomfortable or whatever. But, but the reality is we have to embrace all our parts and, and right. welcome them and know that God loves us as a whole embodied, unique person. And he, he knows we're flawed. I think he's noticed that. Yeah. He's picked up on that fact. He's picked up on that. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so the goal is to really integrate your conscious with your unconscious and understand what they all bring to the table. Yeah, you want to be a complete embodied person. And when you, when you stop fighting with yourselves, remarkable things can happen, mm -hmm. ranging from outward action to, to inward reconciliation and interior peace and being able to, to practice your values and, and just to be, to be a person in, in God's presence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if there's, there's one thing or two things or a few things you want our listeners to know about the elephant or how the rider relates to the elephant, what, what would those be? Sure. So the, this metaphor is based, it's based on a lot of neuroscience research and psychological research and studies of how the different parts of the brain interact and it's a powerful metaphor because it's it's based in the, this it has this scientific basis it also has this experiential basis so look one big quirk of the elephant is it has a negative bias a negative bias our brain is always scanning for threats and when it comes to something that's negative it stops the scan and it picks it up and it turns it over and it looks at it and it wants to know more. Oh, is this a threat? And it's not just saber toothed tigers, right? It's threats to our status, threats to belonging, threats to our relationships, mm -hmm. threats to our status at work. You know, all these things are registered as problems to be examined. And one result is if we don't give our brain something to do, it's going to start spinning and it's going to keep spinning until it finds something negative right. <laughs> to latch onto. Yeah. Because, because that's how it works. It has a huge negative bias. So, so just let me reflect back and see if I get this. So you're saying the elephant likes a focus. And its tendency is to focus on these potentially negative or threatening things in the environment. It's like it's got its big microscope or telescope and it's going to search around for them sort of automatically. And, and it's going to do that unless you're sort of giving it something else to focus on. I mean, would that be correct? Yeah, your, your elephant needs some direction. Okay. So we can be going through our day and lots of things are happening and it's not going to take a lot of conscious direction because our elephant kind of knows what needs to be done mm. and what we got to do. But when we are, are not giving it any direction, it, it will, it will spin off in, yeah. in these negative directions. And often that's, that's not helpful at all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
So if you were kind of saying, well, if you're going through your day and it, it sort of knows what to do, it's all good. But I'm guessing if you changed something or you wanted to make a change, that that might take a lot of direction. Sure. So the elephant, this is another point. The elephant loves a routine, doesn't oh. like change. Oh. Oh, well, there you go. Wants to do the things the same way. That's the most efficient mm -hmm. for it. Doesn't have to learn how to do something 10 different ways. If it can do it one way, that's useful. Right. That's good enough. So when we encounter an obstacle or something that's different, then yeah, all of a sudden our, our unconscious mind needs some direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because this negative bias we are quick to jump to the idea that, hey, there shouldn't be an obstacle here. What's this? This is ridiculous. <laughs> Get out of my way. Get out of my way. This is wrong. <laughs> this shouldn't be happening. Yeah. But the reality is you can't walk the length of the house without having to walk around a piece of furniture. If you're trying to go anywhere, any distance between two points, there's things you got to walk around and those are called obstacles. And some are bigger than others. But it's kind of hilarious, really, when you think about it, that we're so shocked. <laughs> like, What's like, this table doing here? Get it out of my way. <laughs> well, just seriously, like how many things have I ever tried to do where I didn't encounter any obstacles? Yeah. But every time I try to do something, I'm so surprised. <laughs> There's an obstacle. <laughs> There's an obstacle. What is that? <laughs> what? Is that that parrot? <laughs> What's that parrot doing here? just it's it's a silly it's a silly brain trick yeah yeah so so what are some i don't know some things we can do to direct the elephant or relate to the elephant yeah well one thing is just to to be aware of the rider and the elephant metaphor and yeah. and just know that hey if if you're not getting the cooperation of your elephant then it's going to be tough. Mm. The rider can can push and pull and tug at the elephant and, and maybe make some good progress, but that elephant's going to wear it out eventually. So the idea of knowing, recognizing when your unconscious is resisting you, mm. that, hey, you know, it's time to stop and, and talk to your elephant. See what's going on. Why, for instance, why don't you want to do this? Can you think of some reasons why you want to get this done? Mm. You know, what's in it for me? Yeah. That's a good way to motivate your elephant. So I'm thinking about this seminar I went to recently, and they were talking about unconscious motivation strategies. And these are like patterns or strategies that your elephant picked up on, you know, probably early on in life. And this is what they zeroed in on. Okay, this is the the strategy for getting motivated. And they've just like used that strategy for 40 years right. to motivate you. And and it the, the elephant isn't asking, hey, is this working? <laughs> that has to be the writer, right? To ask that question. So they pulled up all these people and from the audience and and discerned their motivation strategy and and for you know across the board it was like you know i i criticize myself i beat <laughs> myself up i try to get willpower i mean it's all this stuff and then you know pretty much it wasn't working the way they wanted it to work yeah that's really hilarious that yeah. so the unconscious mind it's it's got a strategy mm -hmm. and, and it's sticking to it <laughs> It doesn't matter if it's working that much. It's not going to learn something new with any speed. Right. And I guess that's where the direction comes in. Yeah. So it's possible to have a different motivational strategy. Exactly. And wouldn't that be a different experience in oh, life? Oh, yeah. To have a different way to experience it. It really would. There's another area. Uh, conflict is something that, that gets studied a lot. And... It's observed that most of us have a couple strategies. We have a primary conflict strategy. Mm. And then when that doesn't work, we go to our secondary <laughs> strategy. And, and there's a lot of strategies to choose from, but 
most of us spend most of our time with our main strategy and our second strategy. For instance, I, I worked with somebody that avoided conflict. They did not want conflict because they knew what came from conflict. All oh, people blow up. Mm -hmm. So the important thing to do is to avoid conflict. And so the way decisions get made is there's no decision until circumstances force somebody to choose mm. some action and then or you, they decide for you they decide for you yeah, yeah. so the uh, the default strategy well when that wasn't working then he would just lash out and tell people what he was angry about and they would go go off and offer some other menu right for him yeah and this is a great guy yeah but when it came to conflict this is the playbook he'd been following for his entire life. The elephant knew the route to go. Yeah. It's just going to follow it, it. That's what it did. Yeah. And of course, people that study conflict, they, they have many approaches and possibilities. Right. To working things out. You know, the unconscious mind is a funny beast. I, I was thinking of some of the marriage work that we've been doing. And one of the patterns in a difficult marriage is that one of the partners becomes unhappy often because it's a she and she's noticing the lack of certain positive things that she wants. Right. So she's starting to become increasingly unhappy. And the other partner, the he, isn't really aware of the problem. Things seem fine. Yeah. Nobody's complaining. You know, every everything's getting done. There's sports. Life is good. <laughs> and... What happens is she's becoming increasingly unhappy. And by the time he notices it, by the time she's making him painfully aware of it, she's starting to give up hope. She's thinking, and she doesn't articulate this, but the thought is, well, there's no hope. People don't change. He's not going to change. We're done here. If he wanted to change, he would already invest it. He would have changed it. it. Yeah. Yeah. But the reality often is... Well, he wasn't unhappy and he's only becoming aware of the problem. And now there is perhaps a time for some change to happen. So all of a sudden, just when the time is right for change, she's unconsciously concluded, hey, nothing's ever going to change. So, so the hope is here, but now it's hard to embrace it. Yeah. 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 Interesting. You know, another example, Karen, I like a lot is the, I call it the puzzle piece. And I remember there was a lady, I think it was a consult call on midlife. And she was describing all the things changing in her life. The kids were moving out, the, they were moving, maybe he was changing jobs, or I think she was saying, now I can finally, you know, show up at work and work longer hours. And what came out of all of that discussion was, all the people around her were changing. They were making plans. The people at her job were making plans for her. Sure. Her kids, her adult, semi-adult kids were making plans. Her husband was making plans. Yeah. And she was, she just had this mindset that, hey, after all those people, after all those people decide what it is they want, what it is they're going to pursue, then, well, then I can see what might be possible for me. And, it, and it's like the, the old patterns of their life were dis disrupted and now they're putting together a new picture. But she was waiting for everybody else to put their pieces mm -hmm. of the puzzle together and that she was going to take something in the leftover area, which is a mindset that of putting herself last. And she was completely unaware of it until you pointed out to her. Right. Right. And... And that's what happens to us often, us moms, is we're in the thick of it. And that's just, that's just how it goes. And, and I remember thinking she, she can change that pattern. She can, if you, if you consciously pull it up and look at it and realize there's options, there's different ways to approach it, then you can start to engage in a different way and, and make the change. Yeah. So these unconscious patterns are, are everywhere. So another pattern that I see is 
with the midlife couples, with the men, they are they are providers. They're taking care of their family, and and that's their vocation. Hey, I'm a married man. I'm taking care of things. I'm I'm doing my part right. in my local church. And then as the kids move out, they're like, "Hey, I'm done, man. You know, mm. I'm I'm primarily." It's all about the family, and I can support, my, continue to support my adult kids, but in a lesser way. And now, there's no new calling for me. Oh, and and so they either become unhappy or they go off and and it's playtime. Right. But you know, all those decisions have consequences. Yeah. And it's a shame to just make them on autopilot. Yeah. Instead of being able to lean on your highest purposes, your most important values, the, your, your wisdom and prayer about what it, what it is God has for you, for you to do together in your, mm. in your time that remains. Right. So one of the things I'm taking away from this, Curtis, and obviously you're the one who's done a lot of research around this, is, is get to know your elephant. Get to know your elephant understand it, get curious about how it's working, what its patterns are, where it wants to go and why or why not, and start to engage with it so that, so that we can collaborate with it and, and really get to where we want to go. Yeah. And look for situations where you're using the same old strategy, but maybe yeah. it's not working for you. Yeah. Yeah. And move away from this idea that, hey, it's all about the rider, mm. that these unruly passions, they're just to be subdued, controlled, subjugated, because we're in real danger of, of not living with a full range of experience, a full range of emotional life, a full range of access to our capabilities and our potential and our intuition when we start to take that reductionist approach that is so overwhelmingly prevalent in these these waters that we swim in. So the elephant really brings a lot to the table. Absolutely. It brings a lot to the table. That's right. And it's to be appreciated. That's right. Yeah. So as we close out this episode and we take away our takeaways, I also want to remind our listeners that for the next week and a half or two, we are continuing to receive signups for our self-compassion series, our small group self-compassion series, one group for men, one group for women. We're starting on November 7th, Monday, November 7th, and it will run for six Mondays. We're getting a lot of great people signed up, and it, it, I'm really, really getting excited about it. So, We are looking forward to to seeing you there. Yeah. And awesome. We invite you to check it out and join us. Join us. Okay. So if you have more questions or you're interested, go to our website, thecatholicmidlife.com. There's a banner there you can click on. You can also contact us, email us at thecatholicmidlife at gmail.com with any questions. It's great to be here. You here. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to be here with you. It's right. Right. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to the Catholic Midlife Podcast. It's great to be here with you. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite app or platform. Leave a review that's so helpful so that others like you can find the podcast. And be sure to tell your friends. We'll see you next week.